The Unions, the Class Struggle, and Communists. This is from the ICT website. The Unions as Transmission Belts. Communist consciousness is a reflection of the class struggle of the working class. It does not, however, arise directly from that struggle, but is based on the reflections of a minority of the class on the lessons of that struggle. This gives rise to a revolutionary organization or party which expresses the long-term goal of the working class in the form of a communist program. This has to be fought for within the wider working class and its struggles. A great contribution to this theory was elaborated in the writings of Lenin and in the experience of Bolshevik activity in the class. Thus arises the task for the realization of which the Russian social democrats are called upon to bring socialist ideas and socialist consciousness to the mass of the proletariat and to organize a revolutionary party indispensably linked to the spontaneous labor movement. Given, given the material conditions that the proletariat faces in its life under capitalism, in the materialist view of the genesis of consciousness and the weight of the dominant ideology, the class, at best, is pushed into a simple fight for demands. The organized vanguard of the class, the party, is formed, rather, by those who look beyond the historical period and the level of class struggle in developing revolutionary consciousness. The party is actively involved in the struggles, but does not adapt to the spontaneity of the moment, but must take action by making itself the communist political reference point, pushing the proletariat to take on board revolutionary consciousness. The task of communists is not, to paraphrase, to paraphrase Lenin, to passively put themselves at the service of the labor movement, mm -hmm. but to represent the interests of the movement as a whole, to show the movement its ultimate goal, the, over, the overthrow of capitalism. The communists must therefore intervene in the class struggle, putting forward a political framework. They must try to broaden class consciousness to a revolutionary level. <laughs> In what ways does the struggle of the proletariat express itself? Posing this question becomes a key issue. The type of response will outline the practical action of the communists, will influence the course of action and the tactics to be adopted. Referring to the history of the labor movement in the century that preceded them, Lenin and the communists of the time responded to this question and concluded that the body through which working class struggle was going to express itself was the union. None of the communists considered the trade unions to be revolutionary bodies, but they were seen as the chosen instrument of the workers in demand struggles. This conclusion, of course, was to influence the tactics adopted by the communists. This tactic called for a specific course of action within the, within the unions, work targeted towards the achievement of leadership of the unions themselves, snatching them from the hands of the reformist in order to influence the class in a revolutionary sense. So the union was seen then as the conveyor belt between the party and class. This tactical conclusion was adopted by all the communist parties that adhered to the third international, including the PC d'Italia led by the communist left. The confrontation with history. It makes no sense for a Marxist materialist to regard a tactical conclusion as a dogma. For a Marxist, the analysis, the program, the tactics are a reaction to the practical social reality and must therefore take into account the inevitable judgment of history. Historical events have shown clearly how impossible it was for the communists to conquer the unions and, consequently, the inapplicability of the tactical use of the union as a transmission belt. And that's not all. The economic struggle, that is the battle for the defense of the immediate living and working conditions, is the first moment of confrontation of the ruling class by the proletariat. A real revival of class struggle by the proletariat, an open struggle against the bosses, cannot occur unless controlled by workers. This is a key point. A century of history has shown us in this by way of all the limitations of the union form. History has shown the inadequacy of the unions to express the real leadership of the workers their inability to stand up as enhancers and promoters of an open confrontation with the bourgeois class, even on the terrain of demands. This inability is not simply due to the betrayal of this or that trade union leader, but is the result of the very nature of the union form. 
The union form was the real expression of the working class struggle in both the structural, the rise of capitalism and free competition, and superstructural, the state class union's relationship, conditions of the 19th century. This has changed. The union has lost that specific characteristic. The involution of the old trade unions has been so widespread a process that, theoretical arguments aside, it is forced to make us think again. The unions were founded in the 1800s as an instrument of struggle and became an institution, an institutional unions due to their nature. The set of characteristics that define them and not just because of the errors or betrayals of this or that leader. Reaching this conclusion does not mean questioning the key points of the old formulation of the party class relation, which we believe is still fully valid. But simply learning from past experience means to regard as ineffective the tactic which aims at the conquest of the unions by the communists and the use of these organs as a transmission belt. Let us look at historical reality by concentrating on three very significant, significant examples. The First World War, the Red Two Years in Italy, and the October Revolution in Russia. We'll start with the First World War. A war created by the biggest or the big imperialist powers fighting for the division of the world. The socialist parties, social democrats, reformers, all lined up with some exceptions in support of their national bourgeoisie and helping to drag the proletariat into the war. The unions led by social democratic parties supported their own national bourgeoisie. This was the first clear example of the unions standing in defense of the nation state system. Let us examine a time and place which is even and even more relevant, which is from a revolutionary perspective. Russia in 1917. The historical period circa 1917 certainly represented the pinnacle, so far, of the proletariat as protagonist and the highest level of pol political organization reached by communists. Russia was the only example where the revolutionary assault was completed. The only time the political power of the ruling class, Tsarist and bourgeois social democrat, was overthrown by the proletariat in alliance with the poor peasants and led by the Bolshevik party. While the revolution happened without the Bolsheviks conquering the leadership of existing trade unions, without using them as transmission belts. <clears throat> there were other bodies that the revolutionaries were able to lead the Soviets and before them a fundamental milestone, the factory committees. The Bolsheviks managed to conquer the masses of workers and soldiers to guide them to revolutionary action. But at the same time, no union was led by the Bolsheviks, not one. Indeed, there were more than a few openly counter-revolutionary actions carried out by trade unions in Russia before and after 1917. To name a few, the Union of Railway Workers participated in the Counter-Revolutionary Committee for Salvation and gave orders not to transport Bolshevik troops. The Postal and Telegraph Unions attempted to obstruct Bolshevik correspondence to the Smolny Institute. The Bank's Employees Union declared strikes to disrupt the activities of revolutionary bodies. And the last significant example, the behavior of the General Confederation of Labor during the Red Two Years in Italy. In the midst of the occupations of the factories, instead of trying to extend the class struggle, at least on the simple terrain of demands, the CGDL, together with PSI, did the exact opposite. They isolated protests in the factories and at the same time tried to reach an agreement in the metal workers' dispute. In a paper presented to the Giolotti, or Giolitti government, they asked it, to change the former relationships between employers and workers so that the latter, through their unions, have the possibility of knowing the true state of the industry, their financial and technical operation, and may, through their factory representatives, emanations of the trade unions, contribute to the implementation of regulations, control the hiring and firing of personnel, and thus encourage the normal course of workshop life with the necessary discipline. One could argue that this trade union behavior is due to the reformist leadership, but the point is this, the leadership of the trade unions could and can only be reformist. The three examples we have seen are even more significant because they are in fact taken from a historic period of proletarian turmoil, red hot from the revolutionary point of view. It is true that the communist international itself and the parties linked to it in the mid 1920s 
would become counter-revolutionary. But this process was the political expression of a counter-revolutionary period, in contrast to the historic, pivotal moments of 1917 and the Red Two Years, which were overtly or potentially revolutionary periods. Even if we look beyond the examples given, at this historic juncture, not only was no union conquered by the communists, even in Russia, but the trade unions in many cases went on to become barriers to the proletarian struggle. Birth Characteristics and Role of the Union The old trade unions were in many respects different from those of today. However, down the years, both demonstrated the three characteristics that identify a trade union. union. One, an organ of mediation between capital and labor. Two, the logic of delegation and representation. Three, political reformism. To start with the first characteristic is essential to the union form. It explains the evolution of the role of the unions over the years. From bodies to defend the conditions of the workers to become institutional unions. So let's start by focusing on this aspect. In the 19th century, a section of the proletariat was able to win substantial conquests that allowed it to improve its daily living and working conditions. The unions were born precisely in this historical phase, a phase of severe conflict between the bourgeoisie and proletariat, and would play a major role in the organization and gains of the class. In many ways, these unions were different from those of today, because they were created by workers without too much bureaucracy. Even though these unions were limited tools for the class and this was recognized by all revolutionaries, they were simple organizations for the defense of workers' conditions within the capitalist system, non-revolutionary organizations. These unions were born in a completely different historical period from that of today. <coughs> they were born during the ascendant phase of capitalism, characterized by a market of free competition. These two aspects, the stage of ascendance and free competition, meant that, one, even if the boss class, of course, did not want to concede anything, the system had enough profit margins to absorb without great difficulty the cost of those improvements that the class extorted through struggle. Two, the trend towards globalization of the economy was already present, but had not yet formed the production and financial monopolies typical of the imperialist epoch. Another fundamental aspect, the bourgeoisie, the state, during this historic phase, did not recognize the unions, did not give them legitimacy. The unions were certainly mediation bodies, but this mediation was not recognized by the bourgeois state. It only involved a clash between unions, workers, and the bourgeoisie. So what changed in the imperialist epoch in the 20th century? In the late 19th and early 20th century, capitalism began to develop the characteristics of imperialism, forming the large manufacturing and financial centers competing globally, the phase of free competition, if it ever really existed in bourgeois economic terms, was now behind us. The national bourgeoisie in this context of international competition began not only to recognize unions legally, this process began in the late 19th century, but most of all began to recognize them as a mediator between workers and bosses to manage the price of labor power, subject to the requirements of capital valorization and competition of the nation state system at the international level. The unions over years came to play the role of organizations of mediation, thus giving birth to institutional unions. The development was inevitable, a consequence of the nature of the unions as bodies to mediate between two parties, workers and bosses, the unions seeking recognition, legitimacy on both sides, even from the ruling class and therefore the state. In addition, another key issue was that throughout the 19th century, the conflict between bosses and workers assumed a mostly local, limited character. The changes in the structure of capitalism in its imperialist phase, disappearance of free competition, the prevalence of production and financial monopolies, International competition raised the scale of the conflict to the level of the nation state and national associations of employers became increasingly directly involved in the economic conflict between labor and capital. The unions have not over the years lost their essential characteristic as bodies for bargaining over labor power, mediation between employers and workers. If this feature essential to unions remains, what has changed is the way they carried it out, carry it out. 
the evolution of the unions is thus tied to the very nature of the union form and not an alleged betrayal of the leadership. This latter thesis is completely at odds with a materialist and dialectical conception of history. In fact, as we said at the beginning, the evolution of the role played by unions has characterized the life of all the old trade unions and also, unlike the political decline of the Third International and the Communist parties connected to it, the anti-proletarian behavior of the unions is openly expressed in the pre-revolutionary and revolutionary phase, as documented by the striking historic examples that we reported above. The process of bureaucratization was a simple but significant formal reflection of their real activity. Furthermore, this outcome is formally linked to a characteristic of the union form, the logic of delegation and representation. It is precisely the mechanism of delegation and representation, in fact, combined with the function of mediation and negotiation, which creates the conditions for, for bureaucracy. We now come to analyze the last feature related to the life of the trade unions, political reformism. As we said earlier, the unions have been in the past and still are places for, for reformism to conquer. This aspect is related to the nature of the union form. In fact, as bodies which mediate between capital and labor, the terrain of action of a union is precisely that of capitalist production. So much so that at the time of the Third International, nobody had ever suggested the unions were revolutionary organizations. It is this characteristic, therefore, that has made them fertile ground for reformism. Even during the last century, in times of economic expansion, when there was considerable scope for mediation, unions managed to extract reforms and in wage increases. But this was thanks to the workers' struggle. Also, at this stage, the unions confirmed their identity as institutional unions, at best managing the workers' struggle to prevent it from going beyond the framework of compatibility with capitalism, channeling the struggle within the institutional structures and limiting economic gains to the requirements of profitability and competition between the international bourgeoisie of their own country. The trade unions in Italy. Over the years, unions, especially in Italy, the CGIL, CISL, and UIL and UGL have largely confirmed their role in the capitalist system as bourgeois state institutional organs, key tools for employers in managing the price of labor power, levels of wages and salaries in line with the competitive requirements of the country system. Not only that, these unions have been a real deception for the workers, especially in recent decades. In fact, on the one hand, they sign ever worsening agreements and contracts of all kinds, which take into account compatibility with the economic system and on the other, invite workers to fake fights, strikes announced months in advance limited to fragmented categories, fights that never harm the boss class, and nor do they even try to do so. These are fake struggles to vent the anger of workers. Even more misleading is the attitude of the supposedly most radical fraction of the unions, the FIOM, CGIL in Italy, the FIOM in recent years has signed agreements and contracts of every kind. So now it's the big talker, but in reality, it has never called for a real fight. Indeed, it very often only intervenes after the fights have been started to derail the anger of the workers and bring the fight within institutional limits. To be sure, the union confederations in fact share the management of the system of exploitation. <coughs> Together with political parties and the bosses, as we have said, however, the limits of the union form are not tied to the factor of leadership. It is not just this or that union that must be overcome, but the logic of trade unionism itself. The many base or rank and file unions, COBAs, SLE COBAs, CUB, USB, etc., etc., while criticizing the collaboration of the big unions, do nothing but inevitably repeat union logic delegation and representation, mediatory organs between workers and bosses, organs for negotiating and selling of the commodity labor power, reformism. Despite the worsening conditions of workers and the behavior of the openly collaborative confederated unions, base unionism has not really ever managed to take off, which essentially illustrates its failure so far. Essentially, the base unions offer to, work to workers simply a true union, union 
The problem is that being a true union inevitably ends up only as formal radicalism. Basically, they offer workers a union and therefore all the above described limitations. Positioning themselves on the union terrain, they are largely bypassed by the existing union federations, which are seen as stronger in the eyes of workers. The mechanism of, de the mechanism of delegation also leads the base unions to fall behind in the battle for workers' representation, but the class struggle cannot be represented by any union. This is the main issue, especially when the class struggle is tending, we hope, to become more general. It must be said, moreover, that even within the base unions, a real bureaucratic sector has been created that, in fact, administers and manages the organization. The pretense of so many acronyms has done nothing but atomize even more workers, who are often divided in the face of many small and useless strikes. The same grassroots unions, like the federations, continue to propose strikes as simple formal acts like a routine initiative. A token strike that the union might need in order to keep its structure alive and standing, but that does, but that does not serve workers, because the base unions never organize really combative initiatives, but also because they stay within the anti-strike legislation to continue to play the part they have assigned themselves. The thousands of alleged attempts to develop real unions or class unions and the results they have produced are further proof of what we have shown above. It just shows the limitations of the union form in any guise. <clears throat> the Organization of Autonomous Struggles The union will not be the organizational form through which to express an open break with the social peace, even on the simple terrain of demands. This, of course, does not mean that there will be no more demand struggles or that communist intervention in the class struggle is pointless. It simply means that this fight will be expressed through other forms of organization. Which? The answer, again, is given to us by history, by the workers themselves. <clears throat> by the workers themselves. In recent decades, but not only then, the most significant moments of struggle have been directly carried out by workers and not the unions. The union might then intervene with the effect and purpose of calming the situation. There are several examples of combat-based organizations and agitation committees. The French May 1968 assemblies took place in Italy during the autumn of 1969, where unions were often bypassed. Assemblies in Poland in August of 1980 capable of organizing mass strikes without the trade unions. Solidarity then put the fight to sleep and opened a space for state intervention before morphing into an organism which was definitely middle class in every respect. And the hard struggle of the British miners in the 80s, the Dockers' strike in Denmark and Belgium, the assemblies and committees of struggle during the uprising in Argentina, Picateros' committees, the protest against the CPE law in France in 2006, Likewise, recent protests against French pension reform, animated not by unions, but by the assemblies and agitation committees. And more, the wildcat strikes of the transport workers in Italy in 2003 and 2004. The struggle of workers at Fiat Melfi in 2004. Also in this case, the FIOM was dragged in by the workers and performed its usual task of moderator of struggle. Picketing workers at Poma Pomigliano held daily assemblies outside the factory in 2008. The struggles fought in China in recent years, etc., etc., etc. The situations may be different, but all are united by a process of self organization of struggle. In addition, outside, if not openly against the union structures. Forms of organization arose, therefore, due to the need to supersede the union form itself. These grassroots bodies, the expression of workers, can take rudimentary or better structured forms, but as organs of struggle, their function comes to an end when the specific struggle ends, then maybe later they are reconstituted as part of a subsequent period of conflict. This will not be the case in historic, <clears throat> in historic potentially pre-revolutionary situations where the activity of workers and organizations of the class tend to assume a largely generalized and permanent presence. 
At a time like this, these bodies take on a different meaning and may form the basis for tools of revolutionary struggle and proletarian power. That will be possible only through the political action of a strong class party. The maturation of the revolutionary situation will be marked by an explicitly anti-capitalist and revolutionary orientation of these bodies, which then takes on the characteristics of workers' councils to be able to move on from anti-capitalist organs of struggle to organs of proletarian power. The anti-capitalist and revolutionary orientation does not arise spontaneously, i.e. without the active organized intervention of revolutionary militants. In this regard, we cannot avoid the example of the 1917 revolution in Russia. The Soviet of workers and soldiers were initially prey to social democratic reformism, which saw these organs such as simply fighting for demands and therefore fit to fulfill the reformist perspective. The Soviets were transformed, thanks to the Bolsheviks, into organs of revolutionary struggle, and the state smashed became the vehicle of the dictatorship for the proletariat. Communist intervention key points. One, to put forward revolutionary demands on the ground, however small, in the current insecure and feeble conditions of worker struggle, to engage in an active political militancy, not just restricted to a typewriter and theorizing, which is an individual activity that is always debatable in intention as well as results. We'd repeat these old lines to emphasize once again that, in our view, it makes no sense for an organization defining itself as communist to regard action among the workers as an activity to be carried out only in certain historical periods or a future circumstance of greater numerical strength. The intervention of communists among the workers must always be an integral part of the activity of revolutionaries. This is carved in stone for us. Also because for communists to intervene in the class means to immerse ourselves in reality, thus gaining experience. Another established point, the submission to spontaneity creates a kind of fear of even a step away from what is accessible to the masses to rise creates a kind of fear of even a oh, fuck. the submission to spontaneity creates a kind of fear of even a step away from what is accessible to the masses to rise too far above the mere satisfaction of immediate needs. Do not entertain this fear, gentlemen. Remember that, as regards the organization, we are at a level so low that it is absurd to think that we could go too high. The communists, in their intervention, can never submit to this spontaneity, do not adapt to it, and the dominant ideological forms. Communists must always act as such. Whatever the situation must be, whatever the situation must be an active part in class struggle, but acting as a political reference as communists. Every opportunity for intervention must be used to stimulate, starting from the concrete, the workers towards greater awareness, trying to increase the capacity of the critique of capitalism, showing the necessity of overthrowing the economic and social system. A fight can be won or lost. Clearly, you must fight for the former outcome. The communists must work to ensure that in any case, among the workers, there remains something in terms of political and organiz organizational progress, particularly among the more conscious elements. Two, arising from these two firmly established points, the methods, objectives, and purposes of intervention obviously vary depending on the historical stage and numerical availability. The reference point must always be the class struggle and the organs through which the struggle is expressed. Today, that we must intervene in the class organs is a given, trying to win the more aware workers to the revolutionary program and politics. In a revolutionary historical phase, communists get involved in the councils to win political leadership and urge the class to take power. Three, as previously emphasized, the union is not an instrument communists can conquer, like a conveyor belt. Criticism of the union tool for us as repeatedly emphasized, does not mean neglecting union terrain, i.e. the events instigated by the union where rank and file workers are present, meetings, public events, as well as to participation in strikes put in motion by the union. Of course, we always intervene in these areas with our anti-union line. Four, communists in their intervention will make efforts to form internationalist groups, both factory, 
the workplace in general, and territorial. These, unlike the organizations of struggle, which the class sets up itself, are offshoots of the Communist Party and must be the instrument of the party in the class. Political groups are thus composed of militants and sympathizers of the party in a geographical location, place, area of work. Starting from the specifics of the work situation, we will then go on to communist agitation and propaganda. Five, communists must hold the anti-union line in favor of the self-organization of the proletariat, notwithstanding the fact that the class can create its own organs to fight for its demands, even without the presence of the revolutionaries, communists must give out propaganda proposals, be an active part in the organs of self-organized struggle, the workers' assemblies, agitation committees of. In doing so, they must always try to provide a communist political framework.